Welcome back to Harbour Unbox. Today we're talking best CPUs, best value, best performance, best at melting a hole in your motherboard, best at emptying your wallet and leaving you homeless. All right, I was just joking about those last two. That said though, the Core i9 series does get an honorable mention. Anyway, the top five best is a series I just started. It's not an original name, I'll admit, and there are lots of clickbaitish type top five videos on YouTube, but I like to think my content rises above that. At least a little bit. Uh, over at TechSpot, we do have the Best Of series, but I thought rather than rip that off and make it my own, I'd just go with the generic sounding Top 5 Best for now. Naming aside, given how well the first episode was received, which covered the GTX 1070 graphics cards, I decided to make this a regular thing. I'll be looking at other graphics cards soon, such as the 1060, 1080 and 1080 Ti models, along with some stuff from the Red Team. For now though, for this one, we will be looking at CPUs. That said, this isn't just a pick the best CPU for whatever category that I decide. Uh, we'll also be taking the platform into account. So this means like the best value CPU, for example, must be supported by the best value motherboards. So the categories I'm going with include best budget CPU. It's pretty straightforward. Best value quad core. That one will be a little bit interesting. Uh, best performance desktop CPU. Again, that kind of self-explanatory and best value productivity uh, or workstation class CPU so that's something with a high core count that makes sense and then best extreme desktop CPU which is pretty much the best extreme desktop CPU. <laughs> About a year ago now, my best budget pick was an AMD APU, the A87650K to be precise. For the price, the CPU lent itself well to a multitude of tasks, including gaming. Well, entry-level gaming anyway. Times have changed though, and if you want the most bang for your buck, I feel Intel's Pentium G4560 can't be beaten. Priced at just $64 US, this dual-core chip comes clocked at 3.5GHz and boasts hyper-threading support for four threads. Essentially, it's a super cheap Core i3. The G4560 is arguably the only good thing to come out of Intel's 7th generation KB Lake series, and it's that good we'll take it. Even if you plan to game, the G4560 trumps the A87650K, and not because the HD Graphics 610 is any good, it's certainly not, but rather because if you take the $40 you save by buying the cheaper Intel CPU, you can reinvest that in a more powerful discrete graphics card. There are some cheap options to choose from, but I recommend coming up with a little extra cash and picking up a GTX 1050 for around $100. Finally, the G4560 can also be paired with an inexpensive H110 motherboard. Prices start at just $50 US for a brand new board, and all the essential features are on offer. Alternatively, you might be able to find a H170 or Z170 motherboard for around the same money on the second-hand market. The Z170 in particular will offer a richer upgrade path, allowing you to take advantage of unlocked Core i5 and i7 CPUs, as well as higher clocked memory. The best value quad-core. Well, there really are just two contenders for this category, and we'll get to them in a moment. First, the reason I went with the best value quad-core category is because many still see the quad-core as a requirement for mid-range gaming these days, and they'll turn their nose up at the ultra-affordable G4560. So the contenders are the Core i5-7600K and the Ryzen 5 1400. I've ruled the 1500X out as I recommend going for the 6-core 6 1600 if you're going to spend a bit of extra money. Also, for mid-range GPUs, there's zero difference between the 1400 and 1500X for gamers. Now remember, there's a big emphasis placed on value here, so I'm not going with whichever one is the best for allowing high-end GPUs to render 1000 frames in CSGO, for example. For $240, you have the Core i5-7600K, which requires a Z-series motherboard, and they start at about $90. You also need to add another $20 to $30 US for a quality air cooler, so the total bill, I would say, is at least $350 US. The Ryzen 5 1400 comes in at just $170 US, a decent B350 motherboard costs $70, and there's no need to buy a cooler as the Wraith Stealth is pretty good. So, total damage on this one is just $240 US. The 1400 also has the advantage of SMT support, meaning it supports 8 threads, whereas the 7600K is limited to 4 threads. Generally speaking, the 7600K is a superior performer for CPU intensive games such as Battlefield 1, but the 1400 is certainly very competitive. Chances are though, over time the Ryzen 5 1400 will grow stronger and stronger in relation to the 7600K. So saving 30% on the Ryzen CPU seems like the smart option, unless you absolutely need those extreme frame rates for competitive gameplay. <laughs> I know I'm certainly not that good. 
prior to Ryzen's release, I was recommending the Core i5-6600K as the best value enthusiast grade CPU. It might only have four cores, but it crushed AMD's FX series in any and all games, and also pretty much every workload you could throw at it. Priced at $240 US, it was also reasonably affordable, and unless you wanted to pay more for a hyper-threading enabled Core i7, there were no better options. Earlier this year, the KB Lake 7600K was released at the same price, but with no IPC gains on offer, so basically a factory overclocked part then. Now, for as little as $210 US, we have the Ryzen 5 1600, which comes armed with two additional cores, eight more threads, and a whopping 10 megabytes more level 3 cache. The 1600 also includes a decent box cooler in that price, whereas the 7600K doesn't come with a cooler at all. For productivity workloads that can take advantage of multiple threads, the 1600 annihilates the 7600K, even taking overclocking into account. For gaming, there is still the argument to be made that Intel's higher clocked quad core is better, but as more games start to utilize Ryzen's many cores, like Ashes of the Singularity or Total War Warhammer, for example, uh, the 7600K is going to look vastly inferior in comparison. Bottom line, how can you not love a 6-core, 12-thread CPU that can be overclocked to 4 GHz on all cores using the stock cooler for near enough to $200 US? Australians can also pick up the processor for the bargain basement price of $290 Aussie. Not everyone games. I know it's quite shocking. And not everyone who games, only games. Some of us actually do some work now and then. It's a cruel fact of life. Anyway, if your work involves heavy processing, you'll want a very capable CPU, preferably something with a lot of cores that can make short work of big tasks. Well, if that's the case, I recommend Intel's upcoming Xeon Platinum 8173M. It's a 28-core, 56-thread beast, expected to cost around $16,000 US. It'll send emails quicker than you can say, shoot, I forgot the attachment. Okay, so if refinancing your home isn't an option, then perhaps I can interest you in the AMD Ryzen 7 1700. Seriously, the 1700 is the only choice here at $310 US. The Core i7 7700K is a slick CPU, but for $340 it pales in comparison. For similar money, you get pretty much half of everything, half as many cores, half as many threads, half as much level 3 cache. Meanwhile, the Core i7-7800X costs $80 more and still can't match the 1700's core count or processing power. The Ryzen 7 1700 not only eliminates everything from Intel priced above $300, but it does the same for AMD's own lineup as well. There's little point in purchasing the 1700X at $400. I think it has been a bit discounted since I checked this pricing, but anyway, it's still not as cheap as the 1700. And the same goes for the 1800X at $500. Uh, given we have found all three Ryzen 7 models are capable of hitting the same clock speed of around 4 to 4.1 gigahertz, I don't see the point of the X models. As a nice little bonus, this base model Ryzen 7 CPU also includes the AMD Wraith Spire cooler. This then makes the Ryzen 7 1700 the ultimate all-round high-end CPU in my opinion. If you're not big on overclocking, you can also pair it with an inexpensive B350 motherboard for well under $100 US. Okay, so you've got money to burn, and as a proud PC user, you want everyone to know it. Previously, I recommended such an ego go with the Core i7-6950X for a cool $1,700 US. I have one myself, I got it for free though, and I'm kind of embarrassed to admit that I use it. If you in any way care about value, then the Ryzen 7 7700 is the obvious choice. But if you want the most expensive desktop CPU available right now, the Core i9-7900X is it. While still hideously expensive, Intel's new 10-core CPU is considerably better value than their previous generation 6950X. At $1,000, it's a little over 40% cheaper while delivering much better performance thanks to higher operating clock speeds and a reconfigured cache hierarchy. Apart from being incredibly expensive, the 7900X does run very hot when overclocked, uh, it's very power hungry, and it doesn't come with a cooler, and the X299 platform is also very expensive. However, it's also blistering fast, and with a custom liquid cooling solution, the overclock performance is nothing short of incredible. I would just like to point out though that I have made it clear in the past I don't recommend buying the 7900X until AMD's Threadripper arrives, and we've had a chance to reevaluate. Still, if you must buy now and you're aware that a competitor is incoming, then sure, get the 7800X. It's still a beast. Well, there you have it, my CPU picks for June 2017. The Pentium G4560 is pretty much the obvious choice for budget shoppers, and I don't think the upcoming Ryzen 3 CPUs later this year will probably change that. Uh, we'll have to wait and see, of course. I'm also keen to see what the Raven Ridge APUs have to offer, 
Uh, yeah, very excited about those chips. The best value quad core was a close one. You could easily make an argument for the 7600K, but I feel the R5 1400 is the better all-rounder. Uh, the R5 1600 seems like the obvious choice to me for the best performance desktop CPU, and likewise the R7 1700 as the best value productivity CPU. And then picking the Core i9-7900X as the best extreme desktop CPU. Ooh, that was, um, yeah, that was an interesting pick, I have to admit. And it's no doubt going to stir up some controversy in the comment section. So I can't wait to see how that plays out. It's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, speaking of which, while you're battling over the best CPU picks in an effort to defend the honor of your clan, let me know what your top five worst CPU list looks like. Uh, quite a few of you asked me to do a top five worst series after I did the first episode of the top five best last week. And yeah, I have to admit that's kind of a fun idea. We could have a bit of fun with that one. Anyway, that's going to do it for this one. I'm your host, Steve. See you again next time, guys.